So thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, stimulating, um, a lot to think through there. Um, your opportunity now, obviously, to put your questions to us. And um, if you can just make sure that you tell us your name, where you're coming from, and if you can, keep your questions to the point so we can get in many questions from all of you, both here and wherever you happen to be on live streamed. So who wants to put a question? Oh, already a little forest of hands, one at the back there, Gentlemen, two at the back, and one in the front, and one there. One at the back there first. You were first there. I think it was Dev, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, apology for coming late. Uh, very stimulating uh, talk. So my uh, question is in two parts. One is um, that starting where we ended uh, in terms of trespassing the boundaries of discourse on context. Uh, so we had Albert Hirschman arguing that uh, in economics field where towards the end of his life he started writing much more transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Uh, so I think this is welcome if this could be done in the public administration and management area. So this argument is very powerful because we know that innovation happens at the boundaries. So give us nudge uh, at there. The question is, how do you empirically operationalize this uh, when we, let's say we want to do research in that area in other social sciences uh, or humanities, um, taking the analytical apparatus that you proposed here about understanding impact of context on practice? Um, because you will, will have this challenge of um, um, ontological compatibility or incompatibility of uh, the assumptions that we make in social science and, and then humanities and, and so on. So that's one question. How do we operationalize such, such a, a, a trans uh, subject or discipline? And the second question is, uh, uh, you looked at it from the Western philosophical perspective. So I'm struggling uh, to understand your argument earlier about you know, China, for example. You talked about civilizational differences. So do you think there also, it is not just about the culture and the civilizational thing, but there might be even philosophical uh, reasons behind those differences that you talk about in the public administration in countries in Asia or you know, other parts of the world? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for these uh, uh, two great questions. Uh, the first one is how we move on with our empirical work. Uh, and I would say, well, uh, at a more abstract level, uh, we needed to use systematically the comparative method that is comparing across contexts. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, more practically, I think more and more this kind of research is enabled by networks of teams of researchers. So strong teams within one institution, as we're trying to create in so many fields uh, here at the OU, in, in uh, uh, wide networks whereby we get the same level of in-depth uh, access empirically as well as theoretically to uh, organizations or institutions or policies or practices or whatever into another context and working together over a long time frame. I think this is really uh, a, cr a crucial way of organizing research uh, the 21st century, if I may, if I may dare to, to make it. Strong teams, uh, very strongly networked. The second question is absolutely uh, fascinating. Actually, what we are trying to do with colleagues in other uh, regions and civilizations of the world is really to, first of all, get uh, on the same page in terms of at least some key research agenda issues. What is it that we aim to explain and how can we, uh, or different ways, but at least how can we harmonize our, the ways in which we conceive of context. Once we've done that, more and more it is about doing research in depth across uh, really regions of the world and civilizations, which is why uh, we're trying to develop some partnerships with universities in China, South Singapore, Southeast Asia, and of course, hopefully India and other parts, because that is really uh, gives the edge to research, and then we can revisit our research questions and develop our research projects 
enlightened by this uh, broad uh, traversing uh, across contexts, even at the level of civilizations, which of course do exist and are very important. Okay, um, with a question, I'll take your question first, and then one from Jean, and then I want just to hear from, don't worry, we've got enough time to all have all your questions. You first. Again, if you could just say your name when you're, where you're from. Yes, hello, my name is Ahmed Mohammed. I'm a resident of Milton Keynes. I'm involved in a local community project. Uh, thank you, uh, your Professor, your uh, presentation. Uh, my question is regarding for the strategic management. Earlier, you mentioned in, uh, contextual influence and shaping strategic management in a uh, public service organization. I just wondering, you know, how how it will influence. Can you give us another example, please, to understand more? Thank you. Okay, good question. Can we, while you're thinking, okay. of, do you want to take that now? No, no, no. I think oh, um, um, can we hear from Jean um, Hartley there as well? Hi, I'm Jean Hartley, a colleague of Eduardo's in the Business School, and thank you very much for a really uh, thought-provoking uh, inaugural lecture. Really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about dynamism in context, because uh, what you've talked about so far is, if you like, mainly about enlightening us about different ways of categorizing uh, context. But there's a really interesting agenda, perhaps, around when context changes, either slowly or suddenly. Uh, you might think about, um, you know, the day after the Brexit referendum, suddenly uh, the UK is in a very different context than it was previously. And that, that changing context may happen at organizational level or sector level, country level, or actually uh, global level. So I wondered if you had any comments on changing context and what insights uh, you might draw on there. Very good. So you're happy to take those two questions? Uh, yes, very happy. I will just go in reverse order so we can uh, kind of seamless uh, a continuation of, of our talk. Yes, that is actually crucial. The temporal, I didn't mention it, but uh, uh, I'm very pleased to do it now. The temporal dimension of context is crucial. Actually, uh, when we talked about historicism as, a, a, as an approach uh, to framing context, it is really about to bring time and the temporal dimension as a crucial dimension of context. So the same place is not the same context as, uh, to put it very uh, in a very plain way, the OU is uh, here and has been here over 50 years, but of course it's not the same uh, in the same context now as it used to be when, it, when it's been established. So the temporal dimension is absolutely crucial. Uh, the only practical uh, implication is that it entails uh, an even more um, well worked out, well wrought out uh, analytical framework to interpret it. And then thank you for, for the question on, uh, on uh, context in strategic management, which, which is actually a, a, a core area of, of research uh, uh, for me. Yes, we try to conceptualize context as along, as, along two dimensions contextual influences along two dimensions, the kind of autonomy that it enables uh, those making strategy in the public organizations to make their choices, and the kind of accountability, what you are held accountable uh, for. So that's the kind. And I think another uh, example, which, may, which is also in a very active area of research here at the Open University, is actually the security, uh, and across Europe, is actually the security and police and policing uh, uh, sector, because there you can really see how embedded into the culture of governance, the policy styles, and so on and so forth, of that country uh, is a police uh, system. Uh, here in the UK, we are accustomed to having uh, a number of uh, uh, police services, but of course in other countries we just have one. And so actually it's a, it's a, it's a discovery just crossing the channel or uh, traveling from one European country to another one. I think when you consider the role of police and security, when we transit from liberal democracies to other political regimes. And we cannot do research pretending that these differences do not exist. They are crucial. Okay, there are quite a few questions. I, I will take more from here, the theater, but um, maybe from Elaine, um, questions that you received. Thank you. It's from Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. um, 
It's from Joanna Ramos Becerra. It seems to me that especially in Spain, one of the problems with public administration is a level of corruption there is in both the public sector and at political level. It seems that although a democratic country, now the dictatorship, now the dictatorship is very much still ingrained in practices. Is this because of the corruption? Can I? I think this is a, thank you, um, Johanna. This is actually a very uh, crucial question. Uh, corruption, both in the formal uh, sense uh, when you have bribery, but also when you have exchange of favors which go beyond the impartiality that public administration and the public service should guarantee is a key issue. And we know that this differs across countries, across polities, across jurisdictions, and we wouldn't really understand how public services are managed if we don't take these two into the picture. So this is a, a very important suggestion and very important line of analysis for all those who are doing uh, contextual analysis. Are there more questions? Uh, yes, Paula. Can we get the mic to Paula? Again, from uh, this is from social media. Yeah, so this is one from Twitter. This is from Alessandra. Um, is there a recipe for overcoming the intransigent feature of contexts? Or contexts are really intransigent because they are built according to a mix of unique structures, historic complex, and social relations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Alessandro, for this very challenging and very important question. Uh, that's another temporal dimension to context. It very much depends, or to some extent, it also depends on how context is interpreted. And of course, in identity politics, as, as, as we're living in this, uh, in this time in so many countries, in a sense, it is those political dynamics that make context more intransigent. We are unique, and so we pretend that our institutions are unique, and we make both the work of scholars studying and comparing institutions across contexts, and the work of practitioners that want to learn from the experience of other countries and other polities, we make that work difficult, so more difficult. So it's, it's really, there is also a, a kind of uh, temporal dimension also to the extent to which a context may be uh, conceived of and actually be intransigent or not. All right, any more from you? Okay. It's really long. Uh, this, this is from John on Facebook Live. And by the way, there's loads and loads of hello messages and lots and lots of support coming in um, from our online guests this evening. Okay. So this one is, can public policy and the principle of public policy management and decision making be applied to organizations that transcend both public and private sectors? Public transport systems in the UK are in the main operated by private companies, but are influenced in some way by public policy. Could we in the transport sector use the methods prevented for effect, sorry, presented for effective decision making and public policy influencing while remaining sensitive to economic business and cultural needs? Thank you, thank you, John, for this uh, for this question. Well, uh, uh, it's of course very, very important and, and, and uh, um, topic on which to elaborate. But uh, it's also a challenge to our colleagues across the business school uh, here at the OU and, of course, uh, uh, across uh, across Europe and, and the world. Uh, how much is context taken into account also in business studies? From my viewpoint, I can say that, that the grey area or the area in between the purely public and the purely private sector is larger and larger. And so more and more we need to bring our context, our framework for analyzing contextual influences into that gray bordering uh, so important area, uh, which involves both public and, and private, uh, privately uh, delivered services. And so definitely this is an area for more and more uh, research and inquiry. Definitely. Some really great contributions there from the social media. Let's take some contributions here, one from here. Also be there, uh, and one yeah. over there, yeah. Okay. Emma Bell from the Business School. Thank you, Eduardo. I enjoyed uh, that talk. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about methods. Um, I didn't get a sense from your talk what you felt the appropriate or necessary methods were for looking at context. Um, I did notice the, uh, the, the slide where you talked about causality, which I would see as associated with a particular kind of epistemology. And I wondered um, what you would say to, say, qualitative researchers who might say that context is, it has to be studied in depth. 
thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. First of all, from, from your question, we know in what wonderful hands our PhD students are because Professor Emma Bell is, is responsible for PhD students across uh, the, the faculty. Uh, actually, your, your question is, is crucial. The good, the good thing here is that you have also provided at least half, if not more, of the answer. So we'll build on that as well. You're right. It's about qualitative methods as well. It's about reflecting on epistemology. It's about the kind of causality that we employ, uh, which is often linked also to qualitative research methods, whereby the, the, the configuration of causes or multiple conjunctural causation, uh, basically what we have is that to try to explain complicated outcomes, what we need to look at is that configuration of causes. And different configurations actually may produce the same outcome or vice versa. So what we need is to be more flexible methodologically, epistemologically, uh, and working with this uh, n more sophisticated uh, or equally sophisticated but less employed notions of causality than are most often found in, uh, uh, in uh, everyday uh, research work. And we need to do it comparatively. And to do that, we need both uh, sophistication and quality methods as well as uh, uh, good uh, teams of researchers networked uh, more and more across Europe and across the world. And so that's another challenge. And we need to work and invest also in uh, personal relations, actually, to set up a, a, a stronger uh, scholarly community in our fields of inquiry. Does that cut it with you? Yes, a big nod there by everyone. Um, yes, and more questions. Um, gentlemen, yes. And then one in the front and one behind. Yes, we need to get to you. Uh, I'm Steve from uh, DMU in Leicester, De Montfort University. And uh, I'm going to ask you a question a student asked me yesterday. <laughs> Was, they said to me, what's the difference between strategy and environment? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you tell me. But could you comment, you know, people talk about strategic environment. Could you, are there differences between strategic context and strategic environment? And secondly, um, you might think that sort of context is perhaps there's one context. I don't know. We're talking about context, but is, can there be a hierarchy of context? So I can give you an example. So, for example, in Haringey, you know, with Baby P, that obviously that caused a crisis within that organisation and that context became the dominant one and probably in some way sort of undermined other contexts, but also in created things like emotion and loss and fear. Uh, which I've not heard you talk about, some of those emotional issues that one might attribute to context. So it'd be useful to hear your comments on that. Okay, a lot to hear then. Can we just take two more questions and yeah. you can take all three, Eduardo, at the back there and then from the front. Oh, uh, hi, Eduardo. Uh, this is Peter Bloom. I'm at the business school as well. Um, I just had a question, and I know you touched on it in your most recent book, but not so much about the context of public administration, but the ways in which public administration itself shapes context. And what I mean by that is that administration itself is a particular discourse that helps to shape the questions that are asked. So if, for instance, you're in a country like the United States, which doesn't have as strong as administrative discourse, and even though it's a liberal democracy, it has a very strong policing discourse, the kinds of questions that that context is gonna raise is very different. So I wanted to know, in many ways, in what ways is administration itself something that shapes context? And then I guess secondly, how is context itself a discourse? I think you have seen previous attempts to talk about context from kind of French anthropology in the 1950s to British sociology in the 1970s, leads in different ways to forms of essentialism. In what ways are we avoiding that now? I think one of the key ways we talk about context now is things like the economic context. So it's a, it's a hyper-competitive economic context which has an essentialist ring to it, as if we can't avoid this kind of capitalist, you know, competitive context. So I guess in that sense, in what ways can we make sure that context as a discourse isn't used for essentialized purposes? There's some powerful questions there, and perhaps we just take you in front. Yes, if you can bring the mic over, please. Thank you, Keith. And then well, you can come back to all three. Um, my, my name is, uh, is Joe Jordan. I'm thinking about the three levels you used. I would normally think of levels macro, meso, micro, in, wa in ways in which we, al we also define the relationships between those levels. So I didn't hear you mention how we would define those relationships. And of course, in the context of public management or administration, those r 
what we think about those relationships at a societal level is embedded in the law and therefore becomes a public statement of, of opinion as well. So that's my question there, is really about the relationships. Okay, a really good set of questions, Eduardo. Definitely, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if you allow me, I will start from this last one and then we'll try to follow uh, the order. Because uh, the question of relationships between levels is, is crucial. And I think this is, of course, uh, to an important extent in the eyes of the beholder. So it's uh, the scholar, it is up to the scholar, I mean, to frame in such a way that the levels of context may make sense uh, uh, as a function of explaining better public management, uh, the working of public, the workings of public organizations, or a public policy. So to some extent, uh, the analytical interrelationships depend on the way in which the scholar is framing theoretically this uh, issue to better our understanding of uh, the given public management uh, uh, problem, which in a sense is also one of the two questions of uh, um, Steve uh, about uh, the levels of, uh, of context. The other one is equally challenging. It is about uh, distinguishing in strategic management in particular and in business studies more generally uh, between context and environment, which actually form the, uh, possibly the main hurdle to getting our book uh, published uh, because we are so much unsure about how to frame this, especially at the beginning that we are saying we cannot publish it till we have solved this, which is why it took some years. No, it's not only for that, but that was surely uh, one, one key cause. Ac uh, what, what also um, colleagues in the, in the Christopher Pollitt's book on context try to do is to think of the environment as the most immediate explanations. And yes, those causes uh, are somehow triggered, enabled, or inhibited, it depends, a combination of this, by the broader context. So seeing the broader context as an enabler or uh, an inhibitor, and then the most immediate as the kind of environmental influences on the organization that we're studying in our, in our piece of research, in our research work. And then there was, of course, uh, uh, the question, actually the questions by, by Peter, thank you very much for, for uh, putting this, this, uh, um, these two questions. To what extent uh, our object of investigation, the context, uh, to use that uh, terminology, is a shaper of context. So going beyond the uh, linear, one-way, monodirectional interpretation of, of causality. This is uh, absolutely um, crucial. The direct answer is yes, of course. The, the public administration and the public sector is uh, to some extent a shaper of its own context. But the second part is uh, of the answer, or one possible second part of the answer, is that con uh, conceptions of public governance may matter a lot, which links, uh, if I understood correctly, your second and equally powerful question to the issue of how do we treat discourse and discourses and competing discourses you also mentioned, of course, uh, uh, neoliberalism and capitalism and uh, capitalist discourses and so on and so forth. Uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, this, is, this is a huge question. Uh, this is a huge question with huge ramifications. And yet I would say that here again, uh, a theory like discursive institutionalism may help us to see how discourses become institutions in themselves. And in this way, part of the context, but also perhaps, uh, especially in certain junctures, the most malleable parts of the context, because of course, all in all, uh, uh, this claim is, is of course maybe untested, but uh, all in all, it may be relatively easier to reshape a discourse uh, than actually uh, tearing apart, breaking down, and re-establishing uh, uh, Capitol Hill uh, to continue on our US, <laughs> uh, because of course, the constitutions, luckily so, uh, tend to have a, a stronger stability than discourses to some extent at least. This is a crucial part of the explanation. Thank you. Okay, and there was one, one more question, wasn't there? Um, uh, yes? Okay. I have just time for one more question. Okay, this is from Facebook Live as well from Rolf Alter. Congratulations, Eduardo Anguru. Um, but what about converging context, such as loss of trust in public administrations? Trust. Yeah, trust. trust. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ralph. Uh, this is a very important question. Actually, uh, there is a stream of research in public management about trust. 
how trust is built, how trust uh, is developed, and also how, very suddenly, trust can be uh, kind of uh, wiped off. And so, uh, th this is correct. Trust uh, can become, at some point, um, part of the context, and there are actually scholars who are trying uh, to measure uh, the level of trust in uh, public services, but also the extent to which public servants trust the people, the citizens they have to serve, and also the level of trust between and amongst uh, public organizations, so trust within the public sector. And so, uh, you're right, trust is a crucial variable, and to some extent, uh, the stock of trust uh, which is there and which may also be depleted is a crucial uh, or another crucial component of context. So that is another very good uh, uh, part of the picture and the very complex picture we are trying to analyze uh, tonight. It's been a, 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 great, uh, a great lecture. There's clearly many questions we could carry on, couldn't we? Lots of nods there, I think, from a member of your family uh, and, <laughs> and from Steve herself. Uh, but we need to draw things to a conclusion here. Um, obviously, you've clearly enjoyed it. If there are more questions, I'm sure you could write in. Um, and um, can we just give a big round of applause to Eduardo for an excellent <laughs> That lasted. Uh, that's uh, real acclaim. Um, there are opportunities here, of course, at the Open University to study the curriculum related to Eduardo's topic tonight. Some relevant courses, I hope, are listed uh, on the slide displaying now. Thank you very much. Well done.